a comparative analysis of a game-based mobile learning model in low socioeconomic communities of India. UNESCO estimated that there were about 70 million children out of school in this world in their recent study. That doesn't mean that children currently in school are getting quality education. Many schools in the developing regions, especially in the rural areas, do not have access to reliable electricity, internet access, or in some cases, books or papers. Obviously, there isn't enough qualified teachers either. The digital gap between those who have access to internet and those who do not is widening. Only thing that seems quite promising is the advancement of mobile technology and network. Interestingly, mobile technology seems to have the capability of equalizing access to internet in the rural regions of the developing world. In 2006, I came up with a pocket school. It's not a name of a software or hardware, but an initiative to help reduce the digital gaps and provide quality education to children living in extremely underserved communities. I developed a series of mobile applications and experimented them to see if mobile technologies can be used to enhance existing schools and also provide access to education for children out of school. This is the very first mobile learning device I used. I loaded a series of storybooks and sing-along songs on these devices and gave them to indigenous migrant workers' children who had no access to schools in Mexico. The children amazingly figured out how to use the devices and learned Spanish. Since then, I expanded my projects with various other mobile devices and education games in many more countries. This presentation is one of mobile learning evaluation projects I conducted in India. This study became possible with a tremendous help and contributions from multiple agencies and NGOs in and out of India. The complete report is available in the International Journal of Educational Development. This evaluation study had some objectives uh, which are following. Can children in developing regions who may have little or no technology exposure adapt and teach themselves mobile learning technology without specific interventions by adults? What processes do children go through in figuring out and solving problems presented by mobile devices? What factors contribute to and accelerate children's ability to learn technology? To find out answers to some of these questions, I visited and conducted the study in three rural villages and three urban slum communities in India. These are pictures of nomad children in rural areas working on math games in teams of three children in each team. These children never attended any school, but they were not afraid of figuring out what the devices were for and solve math problems presented on the devices. These are the pictures of children working in teams in structured education settings, such as schools or community centers. In all these cases, the children did not receive any instruction on how to turn on the device or how to solve problems. But in most cases, between average 10 to 40 minutes, the children figured out the game logic and solved the math problems. This is a screenshot of the mobile math game running on a mobile device with a Linux operating system and Flash. This math game involves going up and down using letters to rescue people on different floors. If you need to rescue people on floor 9 while you are on floor 0, you need to choose the right length letter to move to floor 9. When children pick up the right series of letters to rescue people in the building, the game starts to present more difficult problems, such as going down to basement floor 20 from upper floor 9. Also, whenever students solve a problem, the game presented the calculation and the result. When students mastered solving problems involving moving up and down different floors, the game starts to present letters that are either too short or too long, 
so that students have to use multiple ladders to get to the target floor. For example, when you need to go down to the basement floor 34 from the upper floor 45, the game shows a combination of different unit letters, so students have to make plans to use a different set of letters in the right sequence to successfully rescue people on the right floor. With timed advanced session, planning and executing your strategies to rescue people and involving three or four different letter sizes, it can get very challenging even for adults. In all these cases, I was interested in finding out exactly what each student team does with the devices. I planted a tracking program which recorded the activity log. When they start or stop, restart, complete a stage, or get stuck, the program recorded all events, button selections, and results with timestamps. By analyzing the system log data, I was able to find interesting game playing patterns. For example, there were four distinctive stages the students presented. Students in the earlier stage, they spent a lot of time exploring the device buttons and features without clear purpose. The students randomly pressed buttons to figure out what happens to the screen. The recognition stage is basically when students figure out a response from the game interface. For example, when they figure out how to move the game character or throw a bucket of water to the fire in the game or select a letter to move, etc., would be qualified to be in the recognition stage. The interaction stage is when students purposefully maneuver and solve a problem while iteration stage is when they get stuck and repeat making the same mistakes. Also, when you compare the time spent in solving problems by the results in the rural areas and urban slum areas, generally, students in the urban slum setting solve more problems in shorter period than the students in rural village settings. Also, when you compare the time spent by different team settings, one device per three children outperform the one device per seven children or one device per child group. The one device per child group was the slowest performing group in the experiment because children in the group didn't have an opportunity to share insights as they figure out or get stuck at a stage. From the video record data and interviews with the children, we were able to find ways to improve the game interface designs. For example, if we make the target door blink, it will be much easier for the children to recognize and if we reduce the number of different color buttons on top of the device, students would spend less time trying them and focusing on figuring out responses from more important buttons. This is a very simplest way of presenting the findings. Those who are interested in learning more should read the published report. Overall, I believe mobile technology has a lot to offer to education space in diverse settings. Advancement and availability of cheaper Android devices eliminate the need of employing proprietary devices and lower the overall cost of the project. I believe public and private sector involvement is the only way to scale up projects like this. Numerous educational games and highly interactive mobile learning management systems are becoming available for students in formal education and children in informal learning settings. For places without electricity, various ways of charging the devices are being devised. One of the most promising and most affordable charging mechanisms with the highest power conversion ratio we identified was to use a $29 bicycle. I hope you found this short presentation interesting. And if you have questions or feedback or any suggestion, please contact me. Thanks for watching.